Hi, I'm Anthony Gosh, a consultant spinal neurosurgeon and the founder of the Spine MDT. And today I'm going to talk about spinal fusion, the different types of approaches, uh, when they work, but most importantly, when they don't work. A while ago, I posted a video called Why Surgery for Back Pain Doesn't Work, Advice from a Spine Surgeon, and that went quite viral, sparking a lot of um, discussion. The key th thing to note here is this is for treating back pain, not leg pain, not sciatica, not trapped nerves. The point I was trying to make here that most of the surgery we do for the spine um, is to try and protect the nerves that run down to your legs. And we're talking about the lumbar spine here, the lower back. However, in the video, I did point out a couple of scenarios where for back pain alone, depending on the cause that there are solutions, there are surgical solutions, if, if all other measures fail. So in this video, we're going to expand on the spinal fusion specifically for treating back pain, as well as nerve entrapment uh, when that's necessary. So what do we mean by lumbar fusion? Well, fusion essentially is trying to get two bones of the spine uh, to join together. So let's have a look at the anatomy first. Your spine here um, is a stack of bones called vertebrae that start deep in the pelvis and work their way all the way up to the cervical spine. Today's talk, we're focusing on the lumbar spine. So if we zoom in, this is what we have here, the stack of bones. Um, and then if we zoom in a bit further, just to um, illustrate it, you've got the front and the back. Um, these are the vertebral bodies, which is a sort of cylindrical block of bone and an arch of bone at the back. They're stacked on top of each other to form a tunnel in the middle through which your spinal cord and all your lumbar nerves run through and then either side of the spine is a window that a nerve leaves the spine through. So here's a cross section of us slicing you across the waist and looking up from the feet. This is the back here. This is the front. So this would be the vertebral body. This is actually the disc in between, this cushion in between. Uh, the arch of bone at the back and here's the spinal canal that would contain the spinal cord and nerves and the nerve that and the nerves that leave the spine and innervate different muscles. So a fusion, what it means is you're basically joining these two bones together here. And classically, the way that's done is by putting a breeze block. You take this disc out, you put a breeze block in that space. And then what you try and do then is join the two bones together or secure them together with a set of screws and rods. And here is an example. So we've got looking at an x-ray here. This is a side view, so front, back. These are the vertebrae I was talking about with the arches of bone at the back and the channel down the middle where the spinal cord runs through and all the nerves would be along here. And these are the gaps, these openings here where the nerves would leave the spine. The gaps between the bones are where the discs are. You don't see those on x-rays. And this is a front view of the spine. So what we've done here is by, to fuse the segment, what's commonly done is a breeze block is put in here, which is made of a, a material which doesn't often show up on x-rays, but it's got these purple markers that you can see here so that you can see it. So there's a breeze block that's been put in here and you can see a construct of screws and rods that lock these two bones together. And what happens over time is bone with bone graft inside that cage, this bone and this bone will kind of join over time to form one solid bone. Now, there are different approaches to get this construct of a cage and screws and rods into the spine. The way to get that construct in, um, there are different approaches depending on surgeon's preference, but also more importantly, uh, the patient's indications and the clinical indications. So classic approaches, the earlier approaches are called the P-lift or PLIF, which still is carried out by some people depending on the circumstances, which means posterior lumbar interbody fusion. That means you come in from the back of the spine. You remove this arch at the back of the spine, you're coming in this way, um, and then you move the nerves to one side, take out the disc and put in two cages, one either side. And again, like I've shown you previously, you, you, you put the screws and rods in to secure it all. The T-lift is the transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. And the variant of that that I do is the minimally invasive or MIS T-lift, where you have two small incisions at the back of the spine and under the microscope, um, you come in, remove a bit of bone here and come in obliquely. You come underneath this nerve. So if you look at the side view, you come underneath the nerve into the cage. And that way you're not really retracting any nerves here, but I still get a good view of the nerves, the structures that I'm trying to decompress and put the cage in with the same screws and rods. Other approaches are through the front of the spine to get the cage in. So it's an incision at the front of the abdomen. You move the blood vessels out the way, 
take this disc out um, and put the cage in. Still, you have to go through the back quite often again as a separate procedure to put, same anaesthetic, but separate procedure to put the screws and rods in. Um, and then there are other approaches where you come in through the side um, or just obliquely. So this is, a, this is with you lying on your side and incision towards the side. You come in and put a bigger cage here or obliquely. So again, kind of through the front of the abdomen, the wound slightly towards the side, you come in, move the sort of bowel abdominal um, structures out of the way and and put the cage in but again complement it with screws and there are pros and cons um, to each procedure one of the advantages of, the, of coming in through the front that probably gets you the biggest size cage that you can get in because you've got no nerves in your way so once you've got the bowel and everything out of the way you literally come you've got a big open corridor to this disc here remove it completely and you can literally fill in this whole space with cage. The bigger the surface area, supposedly the better the fusion and the less chance there is of subsidence, i.e. the cage sinking in to the bone. So you tend to get a better quality um, fusion in, in doing that. Likewise, when you come in laterally or um, one of the setbacks of doing the a lift is that you have a big major blood vessel that comes down the middle here. You, two major blood vessels, the aorta and the vena cava, which then divide lower down. This is quite a nice approach for L5S1 at the bottom of the spine, where you're just beneath that division of the blood vessels. You get tend to get safer entry, and you tend to do that approach with a vascular surgeon. This is what I tend to do because uh, it's safer. They're used to handling the blood vessels uh, and it allows you to get the, the cage in. Higher up, slightly higher up the spine, the vessels in the way. So some surgeons prefer what is called the x lift, extreme lateral or o lift, um, or bleak lateral. The trouble with these is you have to come through the psoas muscle to get in, to get into this space. So if I go to this picture, this is looking at the front of the spine. This is the, the psoas muscle, which is a muscle attached to the spine and your femur. And it's the hip flexor. It's what flexes your leg um, at the hip. Coming through that muscle and disturbing it can weaken the muscle. Usually that's tem temporary, but it does uh, improve with time. Uh, but there is a risk of causing some more permanent damage to it. And also you have a plexus, a bundle of nerves that are around this that can get irritated. The oblique um, approach where you come in a bit more diagonally um, avoids you going through the muscle, but you still have to retract on it slightly. And that in itself can cause weakness of the muscle and again, some dysfunction of the nerves that flex the muscles. My personal preference for that reason is the minimally invasive T-lift. It allows me to get a relatively decent sized cage um, obliquely in a sort of diagonal angle um, with the screws. And I get a good, I get a good view. I get a good view of the, the nerves leaving the spine and the nerves within the spine. So I know that I've visually um, decompressed this nerves. They say the disadvantage or the advantages of these approaches, the X lift, O lift and A lift, is that you're avoiding disrupting the muscles at the back of the spine, which can cause back pain. Well, the minimally invasive T lift is just very minimal disturbance. To be honest, it's the same amount of disturbance required to get the screws and rods in that you would need to do for a lot of these approaches anyway. So that's my personal preference. Briefly, let's talk about some of the limitations. So the A lift, the anterior lumbar interbody fusion, we already, where you come in this way into the L5 S1 disc. Often you have a, the blood vessels that run down the middle of the spine here, they kind of divide around here into a sort of upside down Y shape appearance. That gives you a nice approach there, but higher up the spine, it can be a bit trickier. Likewise, the sort of lateral approaches I mentioned, the X lift or the O lift, the oblique views where you've got the muscle in the way. The other thing that blocks you at the lower discs, L4-5 and L5-S1, these two lower discs, sometimes this big pelvic bone here can get in the way. So these, these approaches tend to be a bit preferable higher up the spine if that's needed.
So there are scenarios where one is preferable over another, and that's why it's important that the surgeon has a range of uh, procedures in their um, surgical arsenal uh, to offer patients so that you get the right procedure for the right patient. And I'll show you my protocol. For L5-S1, so the lowest disc in your lumbar spine, the very bottom disc, let's look at this x-ray here. That's the front, that's the back. These are the vertebral bodies, and these gaps in between are the discs. Now, if we just look at the other disc, you the 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 bones above and below the disc, where the disc actually lies of the, of the two bones, they're usually relatively parallel, not quite. There's a bit of an angulation. There's always a natural backward curvature, which causes a kind of open mouth effect at the front, where the front is wider than the back. But that is less so higher up the spine. At L5-S1, however, you've got th that effect is quite marked. Usually you've got quite a big, a bigger sort of space at the front, disc space at the front, compared to the back. So when you're coming in through the back of the spine, it's sometimes difficult to get a decent shaped cage to fill that gap nicely and, and achieve a good fusion. That's what I was talking about earlier, sometimes a cage can subside. So this is a patient who had an anterior lumbar interbody fusion where we came in through the front. And with this type of cage, um, we're able to secure it with screws from the front. So um, this is sort of the approach you put the cage in and it's got four screws that embed into the bone um, and this is the cage itself what it looks like at the front you've got two screws pointing upwards two screws pointing downwards so that's my approach for l5s1 then anywhere above that level l5s1 that needs fusion um, i tend to prefer the um, the t-lift approach so coming in from the back obliquely through two very small incisions uh, and then putting in the cage in that way and then securing it with the screws. Very small operation. You position the patient once. Um, not a very long procedure and they can be out of hospital the next day. And then the lateral approaches, it's rare that I use them, but I tend to spare it for patients who have had previous surgery at the back of the spine. And let's just say the level above or below um, needs fusing for whatever reason. Trying to avoid all the scar tissue at the back, especially if nerves have been exposed, um, sometimes it is better to come in through the side and then if you do have to complement it with screws at the back you don't have to go too deep with a dissection as a surgeon it's sometimes easier, easier to just extend the construct so that, that's the exceptions I make my preference then therefore L5S1 I come in from the front because it's easier to get a bigger cage in uh, that accommodates the angle of this uh, disc space and everything else are coming through the back. It avoids damage to any of the muscles that flex the hip, the outside nerves um, of the lumbar plexus, um, and that's generally worked quite well for me. And then for revision surgery, if someone had loads of surgery at the back of the spine, sometimes the oblique views or the, the sort of lateral side approaches can be beneficial. The most important thing is the getting the indication for lumbar fusion, for spinal fusion, right. And that's the difference between when it works and when it doesn't work. Often, what, what, the reason it's because a lot of controversy, and you'll see this online on searches, a lot of people are fearful of fusion. There's a lot of stuff online why it doesn't work, all that kind of stuff. Most of the time, it's because the indication to do it, the reason that it was chosen as a procedure, um, has been incorrect. So I'm going to go through my reasoning and why I choose it and the scenarios I choose it in. So the main indication I, I fuse the spine, and this is most of the time if, if I'm fusing the spine, um, is what we call a spondylolisthesis, which happens to be unstable. So here we have a picture of a spine, uh, front, back, this is the x-ray, um, and this is the stack of bones. And you can appreciate this bone here has slipped forwards relative to that bone there. And that's because of a defect at the back of the bone. We call this an ismic spondylolisthesis, and this is called a path defect. And over time, it slipped forward. And in this patient, it's a bit unstable. If the bones move back and forth, and clinically, the patient has a lot of back pain, um, particularly on weight bearing, moving, turning in bed at night. Uh, and we've proven that this is unstable radiologically. The patient has failed the conservative measures, which I always try first. So I always try the core strengthening stuff, some of the cognitive functional therapy, which I've done in another video. Um, if in pain management, if all of that is failed, then fusing this segment, realigning it, fusing it can give good results. Also with the spondylolisthesis, not always. Sometimes because the bone slipped forward, the channel that the nerve runs through can narrow 
And also these, these openings here that the nerves leave through can also narrow and trap the nerve. So sometimes coming in through the back and just decompressing the nerves, if patients have leg pain, for example, because of trapped nerves, in this scenario, simple decompression of the nerve can destabilize the segment if it's already slipped. So that's where a fusion would work very well. And finally, I want to mention one very rare scenario um, for back pain alone without demonstrated instability. This is a very rare scenario which can be useful for. So here we have um, an MRI of the lumbar spine. That's the front. This is the back. And these are the stack of bones with the discs in between. You can probably appreciate this disc here in this patient has collapsed down over time with wear and tear. That alone is a very, very common finding. And I would actually class that as normal. It happens to a lot of us above the age of 40 who have never experienced back pain. If you were to randomly have an MRI scan, it's a common finding. However, in patients who have quite severe lower lumbar back pain, if you've got very bad lower lumbar back pain and you find that that's the only disc on your scan that shows an abnormality with these findings in the adjacent bones where you've got this sort of inflammation, this may be a, there may be a case for doing a fusion. Not in everyone though. So you have to have failed all of the conservative measures, physiotherapy, core strengthening, um, lifestyle modifications, cognitive functional therapy. If you failed all of that, um, the next thing I do is called a SPECT CT scan where a radioactive contrast is injected. And if at, at the same region, you've got this, um, what we call increased osteoblastic activity, we find that the cells in the bones here are very active and it matches the MRI scan, then carrying out fusion on, on these patients can achieve good results. So in this patient, I showed this picture earlier, actually, that's where the cage went in through an A-lift approach and just the screws. But get this, because there was no instability, uh, spondylolisthesis, putting the screws in alone from the front was adequate. So it was just one approach, fused the spine, and this patient did very well. But now I wanna explain using the same example, um, why when fusion doesn't work about um no 10 15 years ago there was a trend of if patients who had a lot of back pain were found to have some degenerative discs where there's wear and tear in a disc and it flattens down um they would do a trial of trying to inject the disc called a discogram where you stick a needle into the disc inject some fluid into it to see if it reproduces the pain to try and prove that that's where the pain is coming from and then going on to fusing um, the segment. And the results were terrible. Some patients did quite well out of it. A lot of them didn't. And that's because it's, it's a very subjective test. It's a very difficult test. If I stick a needle in anyone's disc and squish fluid in it, um, that, that itself can just generate pain anyway. So it's, you have to determine in the spine, where is the pain generator? And often you'll find it's not as simple as saying, yes, it's from it's coming from a disc or a single part of the spine. So the scenarios I showed you where it works are actually a minority of people. And that's what's important to get right. Working fusing spines because of wear and tear or degenerative changes um, is not on its own an indication. These changes are common and I would describe them actually as normal in the majority of patients. I hope you found that helpful. If you did, please click the like button and subscribe to the channel. It really helps people suffering with back pain and spine disease uh, access this information that I try and post uh, weekly. For more information, please visit our website at spinemdt.com where you can see our three-step process to a better back. Our goal at the Spine MDT is to find the least invasive solution that gives you the longest lasting result and we're able to do that by working with a whole network of all spine care professions, physiotherapists, osteopaths, chiropractors, spine specialists, all supervised or overseen, the care is overseen throughout their journey by a spine surgeon. So please click the notification button just to stay up to speed with future videos posted. Thank you very much for listening.